What we're going to do is, obviously, we want to talk about systems research first. And now, system is quite a buzzword. It's a bit like net zero is a buzzword. System is a buzzword. And then, if you talk to people, everyone gives you a different definition of what system is. Well, if you ask me what system is, because, well, I'm in control of the slides, I'm in control of the topic group system, so I kind of like have the power to tell you what systems are when I talk, when I talk about systems. And what we did in Supergen on systems was really about the role and the impact of bioenergy on the current and future energy system and the interfacing sectors. And it is also about policy and relevant for policy and the implication on policy objectives. But What's also very important, so we have all these kind of like different things in systems and especially around sustainability because we do buy energy for climate change mitigation targets, but we have to make sure, and we heard it a lot today, another buzzword for sustainability. And we talk about sustainability, we in the systems group talk about environmental, social and economic sustainability. But what is even more important for us is the interfaces between these different aspects in systems because we're talking about a system. So no aspect sits by itself. They all influence each other. And our work focuses a lot around the interactions between different aspects. Yes, we look at single aspects, where Patricia would say, like, yes, we need the specialists. We need disciplinary focus as well. But we also need to understand how is the system influenced from internal factors and from external factors. And how does that system integrate? Um, I should stop talking because, as I said, 30 minutes each. Um, so <laughs> I'm about to that as a joke. I'm about to that. <laughs> yeah, that as a joke. Um, so I'm handing over to the researchers here, and which shows you the breadth of the systems research we have done in, in Supergen. So, and the first person to speak is Alberto. And Alberto, you have five minutes, and then I cut you off. I am putting this in the, <laughs> in the phone. <laughs> oh, I have a whip, you don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so my name is Alberto, and the first system uh, we were going to talk about myself is uh, Beck Systems. So I am going to give a brief introduction. Most of you for sure are familiar with uh, what BEX is, but it's uh, a system that creates a, a negative flow from the atmosphere, CO2 from the atmosphere to the underground to permanent storage. So the biomass is uh, sequestering the CO2. Then this biomass is converted uh, th through one of the pathways available into an energy vector, an energy carrier. In this process, in most of them, uh, CO2 emissions are created, so the aim is to uh, capture part of this CO2 that is created so that we uh, store permanently this CO2. We still have one uh, positive flow that is returned to the atmosphere, but the aim is to have, uh, in the end, an overall negative flow so that we are uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So BEX, there is a lot of hope of BEX. Uh, if you were yesterday at uh, Patricia's uh, talk, we saw these targets that they are globally and uh, nationally wise in the UK. Uh, there are uh, some pretty nice and uh, high targets, and we are very far away from there, like in three order of magnitude below in the global uh, basis and two order of magnitude below in the UK. So there is a lot of things to be done, uh, and the purpose of th this work is to evaluate uh, like different uh, systems so that we can encourage people to opt for BECs and start uh, hopefully like uh, developing this technology. So the methodology that I am using to compute the, the net negative emission potential of BEX system is like making a high-level feedstock resource assessment, not as detailed as the one we saw earlier in today, but uh, some to know or be aware of uh, which amount of feedstock is available out there for using in these systems. We perform the process modeling. With this, uh, we do the mass and energy balances that are the most interesting thing for us. And then we perform the life cycle assessment on this uh, system itself. So with that, we have the net negative emissions. And always when we are evaluating life cycle assessment, we have our system boundaries. This figure, you are most of you are aware of it. Yesterday it was shown as well. So we investigate the the, the CO2 balance in each of the states of the system, and with that we have the whole score for the whole system itself. So uh, this is a very short presentation, so I want to give you some key messages here. So in this, we have evaluated the conversion of uh, wood residue to hydrogen. So 
we investigated that the same system can be operated differently and this will uh, mean different scores. So I am showing in this graph three different parameters and we see how they evolved. The first one is the hydrogen production. So it's the megawatt that the plant uh, that we have decided, this is a very small size plant uh, for hydrogen production. So we see that the same process differently operated uh, have uh, shifts in the output uh, for the hydrogen production. Uh, we have the CO2 that is uh, removed uh, from the system. Of course, we see here trade-offs as yesterday we saw. You need energy for removing the CO2. So that uh, affects the yield of the process. So more uh, removal requires uh, less hydrogen production because you have uh, less energy available for the hydrogen production itself. So in each of the operation mode, we have the, the net emissions for the system. We see very high variation here as well. And uh, what I want to focus, this is uh, so in carbon in kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour. This is the common metric that is used for energy systems. So if we see at this graph, we can see that the, the fourth uh, that has the biggest uh, green uh, bar will be the most uh, convenient in terms of uh, negative emissions. But this is when we are uh, evaluating biomass, we decide that this is not, uh, or we think that this is not the only uh, information that we want to convey. But also we, we need to evaluate the, like, the negative emissions per kilogram or per ton of biomass, per unit of biomass that is evaluated. Biomass, sustainable biomass especially, is a very limited uh, resource. So we see that when we evaluate per ton of uh, biomass that we are uh, utilizing in our system, these differences is the light green. They are not so big now. So it's not those, that evident that the fourth one, that is the one that is producing the less uh, hydrogen, uh, megawatt of hydrogen, there is not that a big difference. So in this, uh, it's not that obvious. So we suggest to use a mass specific emission uh, factor that conveys also this uh, information here. So finally, uh, what we are doing is like comparing the, like uh, the targets. This uh, table is a traffic light table that we compare the, the process uh, baseline, the maximum production, and the <laughs> I'm uh, currently off. So we can, here what we are computing is the, the trade-offs between uh, production and, uh, and carbon dioxide removal, and we compare them with the, with the targets. We see the requirement in biomass, and uh, we compare this with the, uh, the biomass that is available already. So what we can see is like we have an uh, estimated 3.3, and the requirements are much higher for, uh, for uh, achieving the lowest target here. So also we can see to cover the, the hydrogen demand, uh, we require a lot of biomass that uh, domestic biomass is not possible. So we will need uh, another sources or a different uh, process. So with this pathway that we have evaluated, we can, with all the domestic biomass uh, with the residue, we can deliver 18% of the lowest UK removal goal uh, set for BEX. So finally, the take home messages like, uh, all the technologies that we have evaluated are, uh, are uh, commercially demonstrated here. So we have the technology, but yet there is no BEX facilities built, and we need to reach those targets. Like, we need to study the whole value chains to know the net negative potential. Like, uh, the domestic biomass is not enough in terms of uh, good and residue. Operating strategies vary to, uh, widely the, the net negative potential of the technology, and since sustainable biomass are not unlimited, like there are trade-offs, and we need to be aware when we make some policy, in, like uh, incentivizing this technology to not only do it uh, with negative emissions. So thank you very much, and sorry for being long as always. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Rob Holland from uh, the University of Southampton. Um, so I, I must refresh my phone more than Patricia because I read the uh, Greta Thunberg story uh, yesterday morning just before I wrote this um, presentation. And so what I'm going to try and do is think about the sort of stories which we can tell which relates to a flexible funding project um, uh, called Global Feeds, which I was uh, involved in. Uh, it's got the Super Gen logo on, but um, basically... What, uh, so this kind of ruined my slide by putting the, the template in the background, but uh, basically the story which we're told about bioenergy, of course, is that we have 
uh, demand for bioenergy. This, of course, drives um, land use change, uh, which in turn impacts biodiversity and natural capital. Okay, so in Global Feeds, what we decided to do was to try and ex expand this, I suppose, and think about some of the complexity around this issue, because bioenergy doesn't happen by itself. There's loads of other issues that we face out to sort of 2050 and beyond. So it's things like impacts on crop yields, it's trade, it's where farmers are going to uh, be driving deforestation uh, and things like that around the world as well. So how did we do this? Well, it was really about bringing together lots of existing models that we'd developed probably over about five or six years. Um, and how we did it was to um, effectively just explore kind of a middle of the road uh, scenario. So you would have heard of these kind of SSP2. So this is kind of how society is at the moment. It doesn't assume any big um, real changes. There's a bit of sort of re um, reduced energy demand, a bit more resource uh, efficiency, a slightly increased population uh, and things like that. But kind of think of it as the trajectory that we're on uh, at the moment. And based on that kind of um, thing, the differentiation that we had was to look at the kind of where we're going to get in terms of our climate targets. So RCP 2.6 was one pathway which we explored. Um, this is broadly consistent with getting to around about 1.5 um, C in, in the future. RCP 6.0 is getting us to around about 3 degrees, okay, so we're sort of failing our uh, climate targets. Now, in terms of supergen, the big difference between these two scenarios which we explored was RCP 2.6 has about 20 times more bioenergy in it, okay, and the RCP 6.0 has kind of got a very low um, uh, uh, level of bioenergy uh, deployed. So you're just going to get a, a, a map and a uh, box plot um, to see if we can make this quite a simple story. So um, here's the difference in land use change globally between those two scenarios. Um, and what this figure is actually telling us is that under the uh, sort of three degree C scenario, so the low bioenergy um, scenario, um, we're actually getting much more uh, land use change, which is kind of counterintuitive. It goes against that narrative which we read um, in the sort of newspapers and the stories. Now, you can ask yourself, well, why is this? Well, it's because we're starting to bring in the complexity of other uh, things within the system. So, to give you a quick example of one of the driving pressures for this, um, so what we're seeing as um, the world you know, passes and starts to move towards this kind of three degree, we're failing our climate targets, we're getting quite a big impact on crop yields around the world. You know, it's changes in temperature, changes in precipitation. We're seeing particularly actually in sort of Africa and, and sort of Central America and stuff, those yields are really starting to drop off. Um, okay, so that's redistributing trade, of course. We still have demand for food. So uh, agricultural production starts to shift around the world for food, feed, fodder, and those sorts of things to different parts of the world, which, of course, there isn't agriculture at the moment, so that drives land use change. Okay, so that's the first message there. So it's much more complex than simply demand for bioenergy drives um, uh, uh, land use change and impacts on, uh, on the natural environment. In fact, it's almost the opposite from what we found. Now, our second one is a bar chart. I couldn't think of a more exciting way to do this, but it's a... Um, a, a it tells kind of an interesting story if you pick it apart, because this is getting at these natural capital impacts. So we've understood the impact of land use. Okay, and we have on the left-hand side there... Oh, that's going to be a bit of a, a squeeze. We, we've got on the left-hand side there our high bioenergy um, uh, sort of scenario, and on the right-hand side we have our low bioenergy uh, scenario. And if we pick this um, apart, firstly what we can do, those red dots represent the um, sort of impact on above and below ground biomass globally uh, for it, based on kind of an average factor. So this is kind of a, 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 um, a factor calculated at national scale in, the, in this case for sort of the mean loss of the, of the biomass. And those red dots are telling us that actually under the low bioenergy scenario, you're getting twice as much of an impact on, on biomass. And that's because of this uh, increasing demand for land. Now, we can do some sensitivity analysis around that. Look randomly uh, in each country, recognising that um, global carbon stores aren't sort of equally distributed. But that falls around the mean, um, as you can see there. Um, now, to sort of slightly geek out, the kind of interesting bit is 
Um, we also developed a probabilistic models to say, you know, we understand the factors that drive agricultural expansion, and so we developed a global probabilistic model of where this land use change will be happening. Uh, and actually what that's shown is those blue dots there is that probably these kind of national scale factors, this randomization thing, underestimates um, the level of carbon that we're going to be losing um, because, of course, farmers, if you're having crops, so we always put our sort of uh, second generation or whatever, our bioenergy crops on marginal land, but agricultural production for food, feed, fodder is not going to choose the land that is marginal. It's going to be choosing the land that is um, going to be productive. And I'm going to finish there with um, my key messages, which is that that simple narrative of bioenergy equals land use loss equals biodiversity impacts or natural capital impacts can actually be misleading. It's in fact too simple, I think. What we found is more bioenergy can actually lead to less land use change globally when you start to include all these other things. And less land use change, in this instance, the example I've given you here, means less impact on stored biomass. Uh, and I will finish there with just saying thank you to the people who contributed to all this work, so Southampton UCL and, of course, the Supergen Bioenergy Hub. And we're going to have time for questions in a minute. Sorry, that was too long. Right. Uh, thank you, Rob. I've just started my timer. Um, so my name's Dan Taylor. Um, I'm a PhD researcher at Aston University here, and I work with Miriam and with Katie. You may also know me as the previous stakeholder engagement manager for the Hub, and also that kid that runs around with the microphone. But when I'm not doing that, I'm asking my favourite question. What's wrong with bioenergy? And it's obviously all on your lips right now, isn't it? And I apologise for those of you who've seen me do this before. It's... Still my question. Um, so the problem here is, is that bioenergy in general has been deemed bad press. And this means that debates are increasingly polarised. And this is making it difficult for policymakers to understand what the best and most sustainable use of biomass is. And this is contextualised by the backdrop of the fact that we're facing climate, ecological and energy emergencies all at the same time. Life is great. So... My thoughts on this are I need to tackle this problem. I need to help policymakers to understand how to use biomass sustainably. So my goal is to produce a method or framework to enhance policymaking ability to use biomass sustainably in the UK in line with our legislated net zero targets. And there are three objectives underneath this. One of them is to demonstrate how biomass can help people and planet. The second point is to demonstrate that current policy isn't perfect and there's stuff that could be done. But the third and possibly most important one is that outputs should be clearly understandable by non-experts. And what I mean by that is that different policymakers have different expertise. They don't necessarily have the time to read a great big policy brief. They might have time to read 20, 20 words. So you need to make sure that you highlight your most key messages in their language, and you really speak their language as well. I'm doing good on time as well. Um, so... Current research is into the political economy of uh, renewable energy transitions, and three themes have come out for this for me. Uh, the first is that between the government and the people, there is a social contract, which ensures that energy is delivered on a in a secure way, at a national rate, um, a national uh, scale, at an affordable rate. And this is so people can keep their lights on and charge their phones and mow the lawn and all that kind of thing. But in a capitalist free market economy like ours in the UK, that can be threatened by private interests, um, money and power. The second point is that the actual technical challenge of energy, energy decarbonisation itself, which technologies should we be supporting? And how, we, how do we support the development of those technologies without risking uh, the social contract between government and the people? And then the third point is around uh, the approach and actually how we do it. Should we go with a top-down type approach, which generally maintains the status quo, re retains power in the hands of the powerful? Or should we look at local approaches which are more likely to garner political support and go do it through a sort of co-designed process? So, that's a bit of a big graph. Um, so, my research aims to build on all of this existing political economy study um, into renewable energy projects to highlight the non-technical factors that impact the sustainable use of biomass in the UK. So this is going to be done through qualitative data collection, which will be gathered through stakeholder engagement, such as focus groups and interviews. 
and this will then be used to understand how trade-offs in biomass policy impact different stakeholders in different ways, therefore understanding their motivations for engaging in discourse and narratives around biomass policy. My final slide, and probably most important one, um, is the type of engagement that we undertake at the Hub. And it might be difficult to see, but on the left-hand side, you can see a diagram from a systems research workshop that we undertook back in July. And this is where we had, we work with the Hub Network to use a backcasting method to understand the pathways from where bio is now and where it needs to be in 2050. So this is from an industrial, uh, academia, and sort of policy standpoint. And on the right, we have a picture um, of a child's vision for a sustainable energy future. And this is possibly the most important one because I agree that we may have different views in here about how biomass might work in the future and how the, what the best thing is and, and we all have our little niches and put sort of bits of expertise. But I think we can all agree that what we want to do is make sure that that child can reach their sustainable energy future um, and make sure that we don't let the energy, climate and ecological emergencies risk that. Um, here's a slide with my face on it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. My name's Andrew Waffle, and I'm here following on from Dan to talk about what is right about bioenergy. And uh, I'm basically going to do that through introducing you to our model, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before, hopefully. So basically, the Bioeconomy Sustainability Indicator Model. This is basically a, one of the core outputs from the systems research team over, this, uh, over the Supergen. And we basically aim to develop a research tool that would enable us to assess and compare the sustainability of bioenergy projects, whether that's a whole bioenergy system, an individual feedstock, a technology, or a supply chain. So a flexible tool. And our objectives, objective essentially was to be able to analyze the sustainability of all the projects and uh, funded by Supergen, but who is it, why is it relevant to you guys? Because it also has flexibility in it and that anyone can use it to map the sustainability of their projects, whatever your project is, however small or big it is. Uh, so that's basically our model. And I don't have time. We've only got five minutes today, so I can't go into details of how it works. Uh, but it's available online, You can see, as you can see there. We've also got a manual to tell you how it works. And we've also got a paper that basically applies it so you can see how, how it works. But essentially, we, we talked to lots of people, uh, with lots of stakeholders such as yourself, and we came up with a sustainability assessment framework. We identified 126 different issues which we thought were relevant or could be relevant to bioenergy projects. And we put them into a framework which we call a sustainability assessment framework. So essentially, we had four main categories, uh, indicators or issues that were relevant to people, to development, to natural systems, and to climate change. Within each category, there were themes. Within each indicate, themes, there were indicators. And then beyond indicators, doesn't fit on the slide, there were 126 different issues. And what we basically did is trying to assess across all these issues, where are the main risks and where are the main benefits from a given bioenergy project, and looking at where the nuances are and what does sustainability actually mean. And what the model does is generate the graphs or the, the maps, as you can see, on your right, basically these radar graphs. So here, basically these are the in main indicators of our model, and it kind of highlights for this given project where the main benefits may be and where the risks may be. And this kind of almost, as we, we like to call it a map, because it kind of highlights where, where action needs to be focused in theory to either maximize or to mitigate the risks or benefits. Uh, so what's the value of this? Why, why is this important to all you guys in the room? Uh, we think it's important because sustainability is not a send end destination. Even though policy defines it as such, sustainability is a much broader thing. Uh, there are many nuances and trade-offs within sustainability itself. Uh, so this table here looks complicated, but what it does for a given project highlights the results at different resolutions of our model. So you've got for the people, uh, for the theme, for sustainability issues. And what, what kind of highlights there is, even though a project may be sustainable and beneficial to people or development, if you dig a bit deeper into individual issues, there are issues where there are risks. So for example, within this individual capital application here, you can see where the VEDs are, things such as efficiencies, techno-economics. These are the issues that can come up again and again as being a potential risk for bioenergy projects. But by mapping sustainability in a way such as this, you can balance those risks against some of the wider benefits. So you could say, oh yeah, okay, I need to focus on my techno-economics. But if I can take that hit, look at all the benefits I could provide for jobs, for people, for climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So it allows you to make more nuanced decisions by mapping sustainability in a way. 
Uh, and most importantly, you can in identify the individual areas where benefits can be maximized by the actions, also the individual areas where you can focus actions to mitigate risks. Uh, and hopefully make you make more mature decisions when considering bioenergy from a sustainability point of view. So going back to the very beginning, we wanted to map sustainability of the Supergen's projects. So basically, we, we Supergen, over the, over the last four years, the projects we engaged with, we had 16 case studies of all sorts of projects. Some projects focused just on feedstocks, uh, some on feed treatment conversion, some are whole systems. So essentially, we developed 16 case studies and we mapped the sustainability of those working with the different project partners in, in fact, it was 23 project partners. Many of you are in this room, so thank you for your engagement. And we basically mapped and identified the sustainability trends uh, from that work. And there is a paper coming out mapping that after we've had a crunch meeting with Patricia on Friday, who will maybe destroy it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, and this is my last slide. But essentially, our mapping of all those different types of projects identified some really interesting niche things for different feedstocks, et cetera, et cetera, but also some high-level trends that were consistent again and again off the projects we mapped. So consistently, we found the benefits of bioenergy projects in the UK were to people. That's jobs, changes in income, partnerships, and access to energy. Benefits with development, that's to our economy. Benefits to our energy sector, to the bioeconomy, and for better utilization of land. Benefits for natural systems, potential benefits for soil, heavy metals and water systems, and for climate change and emissions, uh, essentially reducing emissions by providing opportunity for place fuels. So these are the sorts of things, as a bioenergy community, we need to really bang the drum about. These are the sorts of things you need to throw at, get a Thumburg or whoever it is, and say these are the benefits of bioenergy. But on the contrast counter side, there were also some consistent risks, and these are the areas where, as a community, we need to focus to addressing. For example, there are risks to land management if we don't do things in a wise way. Uh, Infrastructure is expensive. Feedstock mobilization is always a problem. Where's the resource coming from? It costs a lot. Efficiencies. We need to really focus our energy there. And again, natural systems. These are all things that we can do as a community to improve our our thing. And finally. Climate change and emissions, we know how to do it. We know how to do bioenergy in a way that makes it low carbon. Uh, as a community, we need to make sure that we're doing that. And essentially, we need to really focus on that green box there and bang that drum, because too many people are always looking at the red box as a barrier to sustainability. OK, that was me. Thank you. OK, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk, uh, and also the opportunity to use the model presented by Andrew just now. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the outcome I applied that model to my, uh, to the, to my bioenergy project. So in, just now I have presented my work, so my project was uh, about producing hydrogen from biobanks wastewater. So in this, this, in this process, uh, it integrates supercritical water gasification process and continuous hydrothermal synthesis of nanocatalysts in one process. And th this process can be applied. Uh, this process, uh, different type of biomass wastewater can be used in this process. And it produces syn gas rich in hydrogen and it treats the wastewater. And also, it produces metal oxide nanocatalyst as a secondary product. Okay, so with that model, uh, I can have a clear look on the sustainability risk uh, associated with my uh, bioenergy project. So uh, with, by using the model, I got this data graph that shows the sustainability mapping of risk and benefits across the 38 bioenergy sustainability indicator. OK, so firstly, let's look at the sustainability risk that, uh, means that is associated with my uh, bioenergy process. So the risks are presented by the green line. OK, the first potential risk is distribution, uh, which is indicator number 16. Uh, this because uh, this transportation, the trans this because of the transportation of wastewater from the wastewater generation plant, uh, wastewater generation site to the bioenergy site, and also the delivery of hydrogen to the power generation site. And this potential risk can be minimized by building an on-site bioenergy plant at the wastewater generation site. So the wastewater uh, can be directly applied to the process, and the generated hydrogen can be applied to power the nearby industry. OK, the second potential risk is technoagromy, which is the indicator number 19. 
Uh, and this because the heating of water to the supercritical conditions in this process requires high heating cost. So uh, the method to minimize uh, this risk is to recover the energy from high temperature reactor outlet and also use the generated methane for energy generation in the burner. And then the recovered energy can be used to heat the water to the supercritical conditions. Okay, the last potential risk is whole life cycle uh, em emissions, which is indicator number 35. Uh, in this process, apart from hydrogen emittance, CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, and CO, which is an oxide pollutant, are generated as well. So therefore, a well, a well designed carbon capture and storage technology need to be built so that the, uh, the CO2 can be captured and to make the process more, uh, more sustainable. Uh, okay, so now let's proceed to sustainability benefits uh, with my, uh, case, uh, with my energy, uh, bioenergy process. Okay, and the benefits are represented by the green color line. Okay, the first benefit is partnership, uh, which indicator number nine. Uh, this bioenergy process requires the partnership and collaboration between uh, wastewater generation company uh, and power generation company and governments and also the research hubs like supergens to work together. Uh, the second benefit is energy access with indicator number 10. Uh, the, in this process, the generated hydrogen can be used for power generation for nearby industry. Uh, and the third benefit is economic stimulation with indicator number 12. Uh, because the generated hydrogen in this process can promote sustainable energy generations. And the next benefit is tenor economics, which indicated number 19. And, and this because the continuous in-situ generation of nano in this process can lower the operating temperature from more than 550 degrees Celsius to less than 450 degrees Celsius. And this allows the use of less costly tubing and fittings. And due to that, it reduces the capital and operating costs. And the next benefit is water quality, which is indicator number 31. And because in this process, apart from sink gas generation, the wastewater is treated at the same time. And the last benefit is displaced fuel, which is indicator number 38. Uh, because the uh, generated hydrogen can be used for the substitution of fossil fuels. So, okay. So based on just now, it seems like uh, sustainability uh, benefits like are more than sustainability risk, but it requires further evaluation and also it requires further work to of, to minimize or to to tackle those sustainability risks to make the whole bioenergy process more sustainable. And lastly, I want to express my express my acknowledgement to bioenergy hubs, uh, Supergen Bioenergy Hub, and also uh, Mijun and Andrew for guiding me to use the model. Thanks you for listening. Hi everybody, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, a flex funding project that we did um, and it was myself and Scott Banks, if we give a wave, and Sam, Sam over there, yeah, so, um, and this one was a really good example of how we bring together all the different areas of Supergen, uh, so it combined the conversion, we were looking in particular at AD plants, uh, and then we applied systems type tools to it. So Sam did some LCA work, myself and Scott did some um, techno-economic work. And we were really interested in using the existing infrastructure that we already have in the UK for AD plants, which is quite substantial, and seeing if we could actually make it even better. So we were looking at whether we could take the biogas and then put that through pyrolysis and end up with um, a carbon black material and a hydrogen rich gas. So this was a, um, because we only had a very short amount of time and a short amount of resources, this was a theoretical um, piece of work. So we did this purely using models. And um, But saying that, the data that we got came from real AD plants. So to make sure that we were, we were using decent numbers, we were talking to AD owner operators about this. Oh, it's gone back. Oh, dear. Right, so the reason why uh, we did this was because the NFU and Jonathan Skerlock in particular, who, is, who works very closely with the hub, uh, was interested in looking at innovation in post-processing of AD to see if there was any further things that we could do in order to get further, further carbon reductions. 
And that really fitted in with NFU's goal of achieving net zero for agriculture by 2040. So it fitted in as well with all of the policy ideas of what they, they were in, interested in. So we did that. We applied um, our systems tools to this. So we, did, we, looked, we didn't look at one case. We looked at a number of different cases, so small scale, large scale. And we looked at the economic performance. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the results in a lot of detail. Um, but you can see overall we found that actually it does make sense um, and that you can actually make a little bit of money if you go this route. But the main uncertainty around this whole thing is the market for the, for the carbon. So that carbon material that we get, huge uncertainty around that. Uh, and that was the main uncertainty that we found in the analysis. And then Sam did the environmental performance. So he looked at um, the, the carbon emissions. So this was our base case. We looked at a large AD site, um, and we found that you get minus 161 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, which is good. And it is better than a standard AD plant. So a standard AD plant got about minus 100. Sam, is that right, about right? Something like that? Yep. Uh, and so we, we did see some improvement. Uh, so we, it, we thought, okay, this is good. So then the benefit of using these sort of systems tools is that you can play all sorts of tricks with them and look at all different scenarios. So we looked at using heat recovery by using uh, different types of displacement for that hydrogen. So where are we going to put it? What are we going to use it for? Should we generate electricity rather than export the gas? Does a small site make sense? So this is one of the benefits of these systems type analyses is that you can see the roughly whether, it's, whether it makes sense or whether it doesn't. So we did all of that and we found that, yeah, it does look like that might be an interesting route to try and further decarbonise um, AD plants. So then to add more system stuff to it, we then um, used Andrew's very clever model to see whether this scenario makes sense. So we put all of the, all of the, the factors, we went through the system, went through all of the Andrew's very clever spreadsheet, and you can see this is what you get from it. So this is the, the kind of result that you get. So you can see there that you've got the risk-benefit balance. So the greeny ones are showing that you've got good economic simulation. You've got, it's all about, it's good for jobs and skills. But on the risk side, then you've got problems due to the, the cost and the efficiencies and all of those kind of things. So you can really see where you've got pros and cons with these kind of systems. Um, and as Andrew said, there are quite common ones across whatever system that you looked at. Um, so we did that little bit of work. We're hopefully going to take it forward. It was all theoretical. So ideally, we'd like to do something more lab-based to prove that at lab scale. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for listening. OK, this is where the systems presentation. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, and you could see how kind of like the variety and broad range of systems work um, actually comes to very similar conclusions because it's always about understanding the trade-offs of a system. You might show that one factor is really beneficial and another factor might appear as a risk, but really understanding the trade-offs in the system and how you can balance these risks and benefits is really important. And that is really important also for decision-making because you might not just kind of like want to say like, oh, it's really beneficial on environmental impacts, well, it must, might have a high cost and then you create something which no one maybe can afford. So really kind of like bringing that perspective in um, uh, was a really good experience over the last few years. We do.